Welcome to our first video in our three-part series on learning. In this video, we're going to focus on classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is a type of associative learning that was first studied and documented by Ivan Pavlov. Ivan Pavlov was, did not set out to study learning. In fact, he's a physiologist that was studying digestion. And he was studying the salivary response in dogs. So every day he would uh, present food to his dogs and then measure how much saliva they produced. What was interesting was that a few days after uh, starting this, every time he'd go down to feed his dogs, they would already be salivating before he even presented the food. Somehow they had learned to associate uh, his coming and, and preparing the food with the you know, uh, food that was about to be delivered and they would get ahead of the game and start to salivate. They had learned to anticipate. Well, this was interesting to Pavlov. And so he, just, he started to study this learning association, how the dogs knew to predict that food was coming. So he and his researchers tried many different stimuli to see if it could elicit the salivation response. Dogs salivating to food makes sense. It's normal. It's natural. It's an unlearned behavior. But a dog salivating to the sound of a metronome or to a bell has to be learned. Let's take a closer look. In the process of classical conditioning, uh, or in our study of classical conditioning, we're going to look at a number of different things. First, we're going to study the process. We're going to learn how unconditioned stimuli, like food, can elicit an unconditioned response, like salivating, and how a neutral stimulus, something like a bell, can become a conditioned stimulus, such that it will elicit a, condi a conditioned response. We're going to break out and uh, to talk about different topics like acquisition, the process of extinction, spontaneous recovery, what we mean by generalization and discrimination, counter conditioning systematic and systematic desensitization, and also we're going to play, see the roles that cognitive process and biological predisposition have on our modern understanding of classical conditioning. So let's start here. Let's just work through the process by which this associative learning, this classical conditioning could occur. Well, if you present a dog with food, the dog will salivate. The food is a stimulus. It's an unconditioned stimulus. It doesn't have to learn what food means. The presentation of this unconditioned stimulus will elicit an unconditioned response, in this case, salivation. Again, this is unlearned behavior. Well, if you ring a bell near a dog, the dog will have no salivation response. The dog might look, like you, look at you like you're crazy, but he's certainly not going to salivate to the ringing of a bell. The bell is thus a neutral stimulus. However, we can, over time, make that bell, that neutral stimulus, into a conditioned stimulus. Well, how? If I repeatedly, repeatedly pair the ringing of a bell with the presentation of food, so I ring a bell, I give the dog food. The next day, I ring a bell, and I give the dog food. Eventually, the dog is going to associate the bell, uh, and the bell will become an adequate predictor that food is coming, so that after time, if I ring a bell alone, the bell has become what we call a conditioned stimulus. Whoops, I changed this. A conditioned stimulus. And it will elicit the conditioned response. So when a dog salivates to the sound of a bell, that's a learned behavior, a conditioned behavior. This process is called classical conditioning. So let's review. An unconditioned stimulus elicits an unconditioned response. If you present a dog with food, he will salivate. This is a natural response. It's not learned. Unconditioned, unlearned. A neutral stimulus elicits no response. If you ring a bell at a dog, he might look at you, but he's not going to salivate. The neutral stimulus can become a conditioned stimulus or a learned stimulus. How? The repeated pairings where the neutral stimulus, the bell, immediately precedes the unconditioned stimulus. The conditioned stimulus then elicits a conditioned response. Eventually the bell alone will elicit salivation. So salivating to food is an unconditioned response. Salivating to a bell is a conditioned or learned response. This is, represents an association, a learned association. Let's talk about acquisition. The initial stage when the learning when a response is first established and gradually strengthened, the time in which the dog makes the association between the bell and the food. 
couple questions that Pavlov and his researchers asked. How much time can elapse between the presentation of the bell and the presentation of the food such that the dog will still learn to associate the bell with the food? Well, through a lot of work, they answer, the answer to that question became very simply, not much. In fact, acquisition occurred best and fastest when the bell immediately preceded the food. Imagine if you rang the bell and half an hour later gave the dog food. It would be very difficult for the dog to associate the bell with the food considering how many other stimuli would occur in between that it might more readily associate with the impending presentation of food. Next question, does the neutral stimulus have to precede the unconditioned stimulus or can it follow it? In other words, what if you gave the dog food and immediately rang a bell every time? Now, if I'm a dog, I'm going to be annoyed that you're just serving my dinner by ringing a bell while I'm trying to eat, but would I associate the bell with food such that later the bell alone would elicit salivation? And the answer is, not very well. It doesn't work very well that direction. We call that backwards conditioning. So backwards conditioning doesn't work well. Think about it. It wouldn't make much sense from an evolutionary perspective if we learned to associate things. If a deer hears a, a crackling branch behind it and gets startled because uh, that may mean that there's a predator nearby, that would do no good if uh, the snapling uh, branch, uh, the snapping branch occurred after you had been attacked by a predator, and so it wouldn't make sense to make that kind of learning work well. We know that learning needs to be adaptive, so having it proceed and the preceding neutral stimulus predicting and becoming a conditioned stimulus over time makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. So what happens, a happens after acquisition? Now that we ring a bell and we can get a dog to salivate, what happens if we ring the bell and don't give food? Well, the answer is, over time of ringing the bell and not presenting the food, the behavior will slowly start to extinguish. It will start to decrease and eventually go away. If I ring a bell and don't give food, the first few days the dog's going to salivate because for a number of days that has predicted food. But after a while, if it no longer predicts food, it's lost its value and the dog doesn't respond. It just assumes, well, this game's over, the bell no longer means food, there's no point in salivating. In classical conditioning, it happens when a conditioned stimulus is no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So, does that mean the behavior goes away completely? Well, this leads us to an interesting discovery, uh, the idea of a spontaneous recovery. The spontaneous recovery is a reappearance of the conditioned response, salivating to the bell, after a rest period or a period of lessened response. I think this is better when we look at it graphically. So, here's a graph of the whole process. During the acquisition stage, we pair the bell and the food so that the strength of the condition response, salivating to a bell, is, in, is, is strengthened. Then we get to this inflection point where now we ring the bell but don't present the food. Well, we're going to get salivation because it's a learned response. But if I continue to present the bell without the food, over time, my condition response, salivating to the bell, will decrease. But here's the interesting thing. If I go a day or two without ringing a bell at all, dog doesn't hear a bell after we've extinguished the behavior. We would expect that after a couple of days we ring a bell we certainly wouldn't get a response, but in fact we do. It's, just, it's as if the dog forgot that it had learned that the bell doesn't mean food anymore and he recalled that sometime in the past the bell was a good predictor of food and so we get this spontaneous recovery of the condition response. Of course, again, if we present the bell and don't give food we will extinguish the behavior. That's an interesting phenomenon. It's as if the dog said, oh yeah, I remember this game. Bell means food. He's forgotten that it no longer is a good predictor. Let's look at the concepts of generalization and discrimination. These are two terms that show up in both classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Let's define them here. Generalization. When stimuli that are close to the original condition stimuli can also elicit the conditioned response. What does that mean? Going back to our original example of ringing a bell and giving food, what if we have a lot of bells to choose from? What if every day you went down there, you just randomly grabbed a bell? And each of these bells has a slightly different tone to it, of course. The dog would then learn to associate the sound of bells, plural, any type of bell to food, such that if you rang this bell, he would salivate, and this bell. In other words, he would be generalizing to a type of stimulus. But we could also do the opposite thing we could cause the dog to discriminate or discrimination. The ability to differentiate between a conditioned stimulus and other stimuli that have not been paired with the unconditioned stimulus. 
In other words, if every time I only if I rang this bell I gave food, I would ring these other bells but never give food after them. Over time the dog would very clearly learn to distinguish and discriminate that only this bell meant food. Ringing these bells would not elicit salivation, ringing this one would. It's the opposite idea of generalization. And you can intentionally do either one of these. Processes. We'll talk about more examples of this in class. Let's move on to the ideas of counter conditioning and systematic desensitization. These are two processes that employ the concepts of classical conditioning uh, in, a, in a more clinical uh, approach. So counter conditioning, it's, it is what it says it is. It's the counter or opposite of learning. We're going to unlearn or maybe replace learning with a different type of, of response. It's the extinction of an undesirable response to a stimulus through the introduction of a more desirable and often incompatible response. So let's look at this situation. Let's say, for example, that this, this uh, child has learned to fear snakes. So the stimulus of seeing a snake is a conditioned stimulus, I mean a learned, that results in a conditioned response of fear. Well, how do we get rid of that? Well, let's think about a different response. If you present a child with ice cream, this unconditioned response is going to elicit an unconditioned, sorry, unconditioned stimulus. It's going to elicit an unconditioned response, in this case, a response of, of happiness which is incompatible with being fearful. So if I pair these two stimuli, one that elicits happiness and one that elicits fear, if I repeatedly pair those two things, eventually I could get a new condition response to the original stimulus. I've conditioned counter to the original learning. Well, that's a pretty um, concrete example. We'll talk about more in class. But we can use that in a pro larger process called systematic desensitization which is a process we use to kind of eliminate certain fears and phobias. Uh, typically, if there's a strong reaction to something, maybe a fear of heights or a fear of spiders or a fear of, of anything, we can slowly and systematically desensitize someone to that, um, to that stimuli. We'll talk about this process more in class, but um, sometimes this is called graduated exposure therapy where we expose someone to the offending stimulus a little by little and eventually extinguish their response, their negative response to that stimulus. Let's move on now to uh, how cognitive process and biological predispositions can affect classical conditioning. Now these are two concepts that uh, kind of require more discussion and in class um, we'll talk about these in greater detail, but I wanted to kind of preview them here. The idea is this. Um, if we think about classical conditioning as being so kind of hardwired and automatic that any stimulus can be paired with any other stimulus to then elicit response, it makes it seem like we, we're easy uh, to be controlled, that we're very simplistic uh, thinkers, and that any two stimuli that we can perceive, we would be able to link together. And the reality is that that's not quite true. Um, we don't link just any uh, stimulus to any other. In fact, there's some cognitive process or thought going on behind this. In other words, it needs to make sense to us. What we're learning is expectancy. This cognitive process is rooted in biological predispositions. The idea that we're predisposed to learn some things better than others. An easy example is found in our learning of taste aversions or food aversions. We very quickly learn to avoid foods that make us sick. In most classical conditioning examples, we need repeated pairings of the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus to learn the association. But with taste aversions, we can learn this association in one single pairing. And that makes sense from a biological perspective. From evolutionary adaptability, uh, we don't want to have to repeatedly have to eat tainted food and get sick to learn that the tainted food is bad for us. Another concrete example of these two ideas is um, the experiment done by John Garcia where they were using radiation treatment on rats and uh, uh, the radiation would make the rats nauseous and they started to avoid the bottled water in the cages where they had associated with the nausea, uh, they would start to get sick and want to avoid them, yet the other stimuli, the sights and sounds of that cage and, and place did not seem to make them have the same fear. It made sense for the, them to link the sickness with the taste of the water, not the other stimuli that was there.
At this point, we're going to stop. This is a good introduction to the terms and concepts of classical conditioning. In class, we'll go into more depth in some of the discussions of the applications of classical conditioning in our real-world circumstances. Come back for parts two and three in this series of learning videos. Thank you.